Hello, and welcome back to Pocket Pulp. Eric Brian Moore here, your host, ready to share another fantastic story. On today's episode, Camera with a Cost, by Monique Rarden Richardson. Monique was born in Oakland and raised on the island by the bay, Alameda, but she now lives in Dublin with her husband and son. She found the joy of reading early in life and began writing poetry and short stories in middle school. Being a stay-at-home parent, quick paragraphs in her journal was all that time allowed her while she encouraged her child to follow his creative endeavors. But now that her son is in college, earning a film degree, very cool, she's been busy working on a memoir, poetry, short stories, and photography. She's a member of the California Writers Club and very much enjoys her poetry group. She's also a member of the Pleasanton Art League and has had many photographs shown throughout the Bay Area, which is a passion of hers since a teenager, but she found she could work in while being a busy wife, mother, and teacher. When not writing, you can find her taking online classes in all writing genres to learn to polish and continue her work, or you can find her walking within nature. Yeah, although that'd be really weird if you found her walking in nature. If you want to find Monique, I recommend one of the links below. Do not, do not, please do not go looking for her in nature. That's just awkward and dangerous. Anyway, Monique is the author of a book of poems, mantras, and short stories accompanied by beautiful nature photos. You can find all the links to her work and to her in the liner notes below. All right. If you like what we're doing here at Pocket Pulp, please rate, review, subscribe, and definitely share. And now... Camera with a Cost by Monique Richardson Read by Eric Brian Moore Belongings never meant much to Annie. They were merely a necessity. Today's must-have was protection from the cold, and it cost only $9.99 thanks to half-off Wednesdays at the thrift store. However, inside today's necessity's pocket, she got more than she'd ever imagined, and the necessity became her everything. At home, taking a sniff of the burgundy wine-colored puffer jacket, Annie detected a hint of perfume and headed straight to the washing machine, hoping it would remove the smell. The cycle came to a stop. She'd forgotten about starting a load before she left. Annie leaned back into the kitchen and tossed her new purchase onto a kitchen chair. Something crashed to the floor and slid across the tiles. Uh-oh. She moved the wet things to the dryer, duct-taped the door shut, and pressed the button. The dryer hummed briefly, then rumbled to life. When she re-entered the kitchen, a sigh escaped her, seeing the salt and pepper shakers, little hand-painted chickens, a gift from her abuela, still safely on the table. Every time Annie looked at the hen and the rooster, she remembered her grandmother. Memories swirled in Annie's head. She could almost smell the tortillas on her grandmother's avocado green stove. Her mouth watered a little at the thought of the albondigas she cooked every winter, until COPD took her away. She shook her head to clear it and remembered the noise. That's when she saw it, an old silver and black camera lying against the wall. Annie hadn't seen one of those since she was a child. She took it into her bedroom and inspected it. Although she didn't know much about cameras, she didn't see any signs of damage. After setting it down on the nightstand, she retrieved the laundry basket from her closet and continued her chore. If she didn't get that jacket sent free by morning, it would be another long, cold walk or bike ride to work. And by the looks of it, snow might be coming soon. After a lukewarm shower, Annie decided to unwind with a travel magazine. She'd always been fascinated with what lay outside of the small northwest town where she lived. A town that offered nothing but shivers down the spine, rain, a little bit of sunshine, empty highways, and solitude. Working at the independent local bookstore barely paid her monthly bills, but at least Annie's boss gave her last month's unsold magazines, which helped bring happiness into her small world. She enjoyed the ones about geography and art most of all. 
Annie climbed into bed, making a note to beg the landlord to check on why the water never stayed hot. When she finished thumbing through the magazine, she picked up the vintage camera. Though tempted to open the back, she refrained. In her middle school photography class, she'd been taught opening it could ruin the film if not completely used. She glanced at the clock. It was past her bedtime. She turned off the lamp, curled up under her quilt, and drifted to her favorite place, the land where anything was possible. Dream world. The wind blew back the white sheer curtain, and Annie saw the Eiffel Tower framed in the window. She picked up her camera from a coffee table and headed across the street. The structure jutted into the sky and made her feel tiny. She took a step back to frame the shot just right. The sweeping motion of her head as she tried to capture the picture made her a bit lightheaded. She sat down at a table in front of a sweet little bakery with a red and white striped awning. A waiter took her order, and she sipped on a glass of water while she waited and took more pictures. Blue lilies in a glass vase, a cute orange-striped cat rubbing against her leg. The sunshine warmed her face as she eased back into her chair and soaked in the luxury of paradise. In the morning, she retried the jacket from the dryer, turned the sleeves right side out, and sniffed. All clear, she thought. This is going to be a good day. When she arrived at the bookstore, her boss had already made coffee. Annie started getting the register ready. There was a tap at the door. It was her brother, Vince. Hey, you, what's up? she asked, opening the front door. I'm trying to get to class on time, and I thought I had some spare change for the bus, but... Hang on. Annie sat her bag on the counter and started piling her belongings next to it. What's this? Vince held up the vintage camera. I got it at the second hand. Well, it actually kind of found me. It was in the pocket of a jacket I bought. This is a great camera, and it's got film in it. You should develop it and see what's on it. Yeah, I thought about that too. I took it to the camera shop on my way to work, but I don't have the money to pay for it now. I don't know. Maybe someday. Vince pulled up a silver tab and rewound the film, then handed her the camera. Uh, I've got an idea. How about you meet me at the school tonight around 6 p.m.? The photo lab is closed in the evenings right now due to not enough enrollment. Seeing Annie's questioning face, he shrugged. I assist the photography professor, so I've got the key and can bring you in the dark room and refresh your memory on how to develop the negatives. Really? That would be awesome. Thank you, Vince, Annie said. She stuffed her belongings into the backpack. So you got that change or what? Nope, but I've got a transfer. I get paid tonight, so you can have it. Thanks, sis. I'll see you later. Walking onto the campus felt foreign to Annie. She always wanted to further her education after high school, but eating ranked higher than knowledge. She was so thankful her little brother was finding a way to get a degree. Vince was waiting for her in front of an isolated building, and they walked up the stairs together. In the photo lab, Vince took her camera and removed the film cartridge. I'll give you a brief demonstration without the actual film, then you can do it yourself. <laughs> Just don't ruin it, he laughed. After the demo, Annie took the developing tank, plastic reel, and a few tools and headed into the dark closet. When finished, Annie met Vince in the lab, and he helped her develop and clean the negatives. After they removed the film from the reel, Annie held the negatives up to the light while Vince grabbed some clothespins. Recognizing France's scenic landmarks within each frame, Annie barged past her brother to the light box to see them enlarged. Annie picked up a small glass dome and placed it over the negatives, watching them magnify to clarity. What the hell? Her brother snapped. These pictures, they're exactly from my dream last night. Vince came over to take a look. So you're saying this camera went into your dream with you last night? That's exactly what I'm saying. Looking at the next frame, she spotted the French bakery where she'd had tea. Did you go there and have a croissant? Vince teased and peeked over her shoulder. I did. And an orange tabby cat was rubbing against my leg under the table. And look, 
There it is. Vince looked at the cat, lying on the concrete with a checkered tablecloth covering the top of the image. Annie glanced at him, hands on hips. Come on, Vince. Doesn't that prove it? Hey, this is black and white film. I don't know if the cat is orange. <laughs> Sorry, sis. It's hard for me to believe. Vince stretched and yawned. Come on, it's time to lock up. In the parking lot, Vince threw a two-pack of film to his sister. What's this? She asked as she snagged it from the air. Thanks to my scholarship, I was able to buy a five-pack for the remainder of my class. He winked at her. I only need three, so I can spare a couple, especially since you helped me out this morning. Sweet dreams! He laughed and walked backward toward the school. The almond butter and apricot jam sandwich she'd made stared at her, half-eaten from the ceramic plate. Annie looked at the camera on the other side of the table and swore it was sneering at her. How did the scenes from my dream end up as pictures? It just didn't make sense. They couldn't have. But they did. She pulled her knees to her chest, and she rocked. There had to be some way to prove she was not losing her mind. Annie wanted so badly to share this with someone to help talk her out of the abyss she felt she was sinking into. But who could she tell? Even her own brother didn't believe her. Breaths came in ever shorter bursts. Annie picked up the camera and loaded it. She stood up, paced, and rubbed the back of her neck. She couldn't make up her mind, face the excruciating fear of an inanimate object, or enjoy the experience it had given her and could possibly give her again. She put the camera in her backpack. I'm taking you back to the thrift shop tomorrow, she said, and she headed to bed. Annie was captivated by the narrow street lined with pink colonial buildings made of stone. 18th century, maybe 17th. She'd never seen Baroque architecture like this except in the movies and books. The camera hung from her neck, and she began to snap away from absurd angles. She wanted to be different, to have fun, so she zeroed in on the cracks on the walls, the window sills, and signs. She looked for items that stood out in the archways, like vines crawling overhead. The scent of maize danced over and guided her to a storefront. Fresh tamales. Temptation got the better of her, and there might as well have been a sign that said, Eat me. The corn and pork made her groan. The burst of flavor was indescribable. Time for my first food picture. She fired away at the plate until she could not resist any longer. Then she devoured everything. Her footsteps echoed from the deserted streets, the only sound, until she heard the strains of a pipe organ. She followed the music into a giant cathedral that made her feel like she had been placed inside a jewelry box. The monumental organ filled the chapel. The instrument reminded her of Beauty and the Beast. She checked her camera. She'd taken thirty-three pictures. Three left. Striking a match, she lit a candle for her grandmother because even in her dreams she carried the loss of the woman who'd raised her, the strongest woman she ever knew. She gazed at the intricate patterns on the ceiling and began to spin like a ballerina. Then she woke up. On Thursday afternoons, Annie worked alone at the bookshop. To her delight, the store was empty. Since she didn't have a computer and her boss didn't leave her laptop, Annie searched the shelves for books about Mexico. The place she visited last night was unfamiliar, so she went on clues, tamales, pink buildings. Intrigued, she kept turning the pages of each book, but saw nothing resembling the historic-looking streets of her dream. In the last book, she came across a place called Morelia, Pictures of its spellbinding cathedral of gold with grand towers jumped from the pages at her. There, in vibrant colors, was the spectacular beauty that had made her spin. The clock's hands did not move faster despite Annie's attempt to wheel them into submission. Her desire to develop her pictures felt like an itch she couldn't quite scratch. At 5.30 p.m., she ran to the school, 
camera tucked in her backpack. When she rounded the corner at the last hallway, she slammed into her brother. Sorry, she said, as she helped him to his feet. Can I use the dark room again? You burn through film as fast as you run, he said. Jesus, we could have used you on my high school track team. He picked up his tattered messenger bag. I can let you in, but I can't help. Got work? That's okay, Annie said. He held the copper key on a string up for her to view, hoping she'd reach for it so he could pull it away like when they were kids. She didn't take the bait, so he handed it to her. Well, well, she said. You finally learned some manners. I'll make sure to clean up. Perfect, he said. Oh, yeah, I forgot to bring your medicine I picked up from the pharmacy. I can give it to you tomorrow, and you can give me the key. Great, she said, trying not to sound anxious. Just don't get caught in there. I can't afford to get in any trouble, Annie. I'll be careful, I promise. Going through the tedious processing regimen, Annie's hands trembled. Anxiety and excitement battled for first place in her heart. It was as if her body were fighting against itself, trying to determine which sensation should take over this moment. She soothed herself by pacing the small area and repeating, You're okay, you're okay, while waiting for the timer to sound. With a deep sigh, she unrolled the still dripping negatives and headed straight to the light box. She saw the magnificent lines of the cathedral. Her voice shook with triumphal excitement. It was real. I was there. One by one, she relived her dream. The buildings, the incredible tamale, rank after rank of pipes, the ornate ceiling. Annie wanted to run and inform her brother. But he wouldn't believe her. No one would. So she hung her developed dream on the line and locked up the door behind her. The dream of Mexico made Annie long for her abuela. When she got home, she found an old shoebox of photos of her grandmother and went through them late into the night. She rubbed her heavy eyelids, loaded the last roll of film, and placed the camera on a nightstand. The 1966 Cherry Red Mustang convertible blasted down an open highway. The wind tousled Annie's long, wavy locks around her face. She spotted a field of flowers and shimmied to a stop in a gravel lot. She lifted her sunglasses and spotted a path through a maze of ten-foot-tall, multicolored irises. The smell of fresh grass, soil, and flowers was intoxicating, but not accurate. She breathed in the alluring fragrance of vanilla and cinnamon. She pulled the silver and black camera from her pocket, sank to her knees and aimed up at the blooms. They will look like redwoods, she thought. At the end of the path, she found a gravel walkway and followed it toward a tiny house in the distance. The strap of her right sandal had come loose. When she bent down to tighten it, she spied a heart-shaped rock. Click, click. Three steps led up to the wraparound porch. She knocked on the door, but no one answered. Pulling back the screen door, she tiptoed in. Hello? Is anyone here? Light began to fade as she explored the hallways. The sun seemed to be setting at an accelerated pace. Annie felt her way along the wall and into the next room as darkness enveloped her. A sliver of light beckoned. She followed it to the kitchen stove. An old woman carrying a cardboard box, walked past. Grandma? Grandma, is that you? Annie ran up to her four-foot-eleven grandmother and smothered her with kisses. What's going on? she asked. Do you need something, Miha? Just you, Annie said. But I'm all right, Grandma. She paused and twitched her nose. Was it a smell or the memory of one? Actually... Do you have any tortillas? I just made some. Sit. Grandma directed Annie to a yellow formica chair. While her abuela got a basket of tortillas and some butter from the refrigerator, Annie took pictures of everything. A cookie jar shaped like a cow. The old brown radio she remembered from her youth. Teacups arranged by color and size on a shelf over the sink. 
and a pair of Siamese kitten figurines. Grandma slid the tortillas from a pan onto a plate, golden and warm. They melted in Annie's mouth, a sensation she remembered but had feared she would never experience again. I should take a few of these to Vince, she thought. Her grandmother took her hand and led her toward the glow outdoors. Let's go outside, Miha. I want to show you my garden. The sight was breathtaking. There were Gerbera daisies and patches of poppies by a lake. Butterflies fluttered past rose bushes and lush clusters of lavender. The sweet scent enveloped Annie, and she momentarily closed her eyes, then realized she did not want to miss a thing and opened them again. Look at my friend. Her grandmother pointed into a tree, and Annie saw a brilliant red and blue parrot on a branch. Can I take some pictures, Grandma? Of course, sweetie. Take as many as you like. Annie swung the camera left, then right. Every image through the viewfinder presented some exciting and colorful sight. She focused on a rose petal, then thought to check how many remaining shots she had. One. A weird sensation started to overcome her. She felt faint. Oh no, I must be waking up. She turned to her abuela. Grandma, can you stand next to the roses? Right here? Perfect, Annie said. And she woke up to a wet, tear-stained pillowcase. Saturday was Annie's day off, so she headed straight to the library to meet Vince, but she detoured to the photo lab. There were no distractions, no voices, and no harsh light. Annie was alone with her thoughts and her memories. The only sounds were her own breathing and rhythmic thumping of her heart. She moved through the dark room as if floating, the processing routine now oddly familiar and soothing. I miss you so much, Grandma, she said into the darkness. When Vince sees your picture, he will have to believe me. Even in black and white, Annie could sense the vibrancy of the flowers, the energy of the blue sky, the colorful display of the irises and poppies. She especially loved the macro shots of the rose petals. The negatives piled onto the floor as she spun the reel. Her breathing grew shallow as she sensed she was coming to the end. Where's Grandma? Where's Grandma? With two picture frames remaining, she closed her eyes and said a little prayer. Please be there. I need to see my grandmother. I need her so bad. I need to know I'm not imagining all this. I need to believe. Placing the magnifier over the last of the film, she sighed and fell to her knees. She'd seen her grandmother's tender face, healthy, enchanting, alive. Annie checked the directions on the wall and began pouring developing solution into the trays. She could not, would not leave without her grandmother and proof. The stench of chemicals was so pungent, but she didn't care. There were three machines. She loaded all of them as fast as she could. Click, click, click. She dropped the stack of paper into the solution and stood, mesmerized, as each 8x10 sheet went from white to gray. A face emerged, the face she carried inside, the face she remembered every day. She'd give anything to bring her grandmother back. It was so hard living without her. But now she had a recent photograph of her, something to keep her forever present until they could be together again. Her developed pictures were all hung in a row, and she stepped back to take in the sight. She gazed at the love in her grandmother's eyes and was suddenly overwhelmed with guilt. I'm sorry, Grandma. I should have brought you the pork chops you said you were craving. I don't recall what was so pressing at the time, but it wasn't more important than you. Tears streamed down her face. The muscles around her airways contracted. She began to cough. She placed her hand on her throat. She snatched the picture of her grandmother from the clips, raced back into the classroom, and unzipped the front pocket of her backpack to get her rescue inhaler. She didn't have one. With the photograph flapping in her hand, she raced out of the room, down the staircase, and towards the library, towards her brother. Fits of coughing racked her chest. 
she felt her airway constricting, her lungs failing. The school was empty. Where is everyone? Annie bent forward, hands on her knees, pretending to breathe from a straw. Sometimes that helped relax her when her body fought her. Her airway continued to shrink. She felt lightheaded. Everything around her sounded like it was underwater. The grass rushed up to collide with her face as she collapsed. Abuela slipped from her hand and skated across the freshly mowed lawn. Vince stumbled into his apartment, messenger bag hanging off one shoulder, Annie's backpack on the other. He slumped into a chair. Vince couldn't feel his legs. He looked at his image in the mirror on the opposing wall and saw the charcoal rings of sleep deprivation etched under his eyes. Sleep had eluded him for almost two full days. He unzipped Annie's backpack. Her precious camera was empty. Vince immediately loaded a roll of film and snapped the camera shut. He felt tears stinging his eyes. When he reached toward a box of tissue, he knocked something to the floor. He wiped his eyes, tossed the tissue on the table, and leaned over to pick up the unopened box with Annie's inhaler. Thank you for joining us again this week. We hope you enjoyed Camera with a Cost by Monique Rairdon Richardson. To find out more about Monique and what she does, check out the links in the liner notes. If you enjoy stories and would like to hear a new one each week, please subscribe. And check us out on Facebook at Pocket Pulp, where we look forward to talking with and about the writers further. If you're a writer and would like to have your story featured on Pocket Pulp, contact us at pocketpulpsubmission at gmail.com. My name is Eric Brian Moore, Eric with a C, Brian with a Y, and you can follow me on Twitter or check out my website, ericbrianmoore.com. Music by Bluemont Score and Eternal Producer from Pixabay. Thank you for joining us. I look forward to reading you another fantastic story next week. <laughs> <laughs>